Hey, are you golfing today? Yeah. It's the second time this week. But you said it was fine. It is fine. It's perfectly fine. Are you confused by female behavior? Wish you had a translator to understand what she means? Well, you're in luck. Introducing the Manslator, a revolutionary device that translates woman language into simple man words. Finally, the power to know what she means. Okay, cool. Let me just check with my wife. Hey, babe, a tea time opened up later. You mind if I go? Fine, if that's what you want to do. No go! Stay home! On second thought, I think I'll just stay here with you and watch The Notebook. Aww. How sweet! Now that's more like it! The Manslater uses emotion deciphering technology to help you out of the toughest jams. Hey, is everything okay? You sound upset. Why would I be upset? Forgot anniversary, jerk! Oh, no way! Happy anniversary, babe. You remembered. Come on, of course I did. <laughs> Thanks to the Manslater's patented FemLogic processing chip, now any man can decode statements like... Are you wearing that? You change, now! Hey, do you want to get some coffee? Me want coffee! Do you think she's pretty? You think she? Prettier than me? Aw, you're such a good friend. Me never date you! I'm fine. Me not fine! I'll be ready in five minutes. Me ready 30 minutes. Do whatever you want. You know do what you want. Could you rub my shoulders a little bit? No, hanky panky. Only massage. Be serious. The man's later even works on men. Finally, women can learn the deeper meaning of his words. Whoa. Your beauty is stunning. Hey, mind if I catch a movie with the guys? You are a lovely, wonderful woman who meets all of my needs. And even though I will miss you, this night I wish to see Death Cop 9 with my bros. I'm fine. I'm fine. Really. Stop looking at me. The Manslater can even be customized, with voices of real celebrities being impersonated. Like Yoda. In which trouble you are, do the doghouse go you? Or Mr. T. I pity the fool who leaves the toilet seat up. So get your Manslater today. Clarity is just a phone call away. You need buy me! All right. All right. Get a copy of God's Word in your hand so you can uh, follow along. And uh, we'll be in the New Testament. We'll be in the book of First Peter. And uh, we've got some work to do to get ourselves set up to that point. And... Uh, a few things to add along the way. Uh, sometimes uh, I, I love Sunday morning prepar my last minute preparations where God goes, ooh, let's do this too, or take that out, put this in. And I'm like, mm, yeah, okay, I want what you want, but I, I had it planned out. Um, but uh, you know, God's always perfect in those ways. So uh, just uh, pray that you would uh, permit um, me to follow the lead of the Lord uh, today, and uh, we are going to Continue in this series called You Before Me, and uh, we're going to learn how to deal with that box of ours. So uh, please, if you would, uh, pray with me. Uh, Heavenly Father, I um, just ask God that you would pour out your spirit on all of us today, that as we consider your word, uh, we would uh, believe it to be true and believe it to be worthy of our obedience that we would believe this word to be a word that would cause us to stop what we're doing, to ask, God, are we not pleasing in your sight by our attitudes or our actions, and then because you're Lord, because you're King, that we would get right, right now. Encourage us. God, there is a word of encouragement for all of us today, and I pray that we wouldn't miss that along the way. In Jesus' name, amen. So, y'all realize that I could preach on marriage 52 weeks out of the year, right? So there, there's, there's never a lack of things that you can do in preaching about marriage. But sometimes what happens is when, when people like me preach about marriage, we preach so wide about it that it's sometimes it's hard to reach in and find a, a point of application for us. 
So in this series called You Before Me, we've been trying to take a very narrow slice of um, marriage and, and really drill down deep in it. And specifically the last two weeks and this week, we're, we're looking at the negative power that is associated with expectations uh, that you have in your marriage. We said you know, that when you were uh, dating him, dating her, um, and, and, and even when you were younger, right, you had hopes and dreams and desires about what your marriage was going to be like. Uh, some of you uh, girls, when you were younger, right, y- even when you were a, a little girl, you imagined what your, mar- your wedding was going to look like. But, but even beyond that, you, maybe you were 10, 11 years old, you thought, I'm going to have two kids and we're going to live in a house with a white picket fence or any number of things. You, you had these dreams, these wishes, these hopes, and they only grow as you get older. Uh, they only become more robust. And you, and, and you have these things, and then you looked at him or you looked at her and thought, I see where you can make my dreams come true. I see that you had the potential to make all these hopes a reality. And in dating, you, you, know, you kind of begin to evaluate him or her as a potential spouse based on their ability to make those desires happen in your life. We said the common denominator in every single one of those desires is they are all beneficial to you. So it's about me, right? The primary beneficiary of all this is me. And then we stand there at the front of the church in a very expensive outfit and say, I do. We said, I do. And now we transition from having desires to expectations. It's now, okay. Now, now, now you're my husband. This is what husbands do. Now you're my, my, my wife. Wives do this. I, just, I expect this out of you. We take everything out of this box and we put it in this box and now we give it to him and say, it's, it's your job. My mom always did it. Dad would always. I mean, come on. you promised, right? All I'm doing is holding you accountable. This is the language you use. I'm just holding you accountable to what you promised for me and God. No more, no less. And, and we said that when you have desires and somebody meets that desire, it's fun, right? It should be fun when you find a desire in your spouse and you meet it. But it's not fun living up to expectations. Because when you live up to expectations, you know what that feels like? A burden. Some of you guys feel really burdened. It's because the dynamic shifts, because when you switch from being um, about desires and allowing your spouse to fulfill your desires to here are my expectations for you, this is what a good husband does, this is what a good wife does, you uh, devolve into a debt-debtor relationship. You owe me kindness. You owe me some free time. Uh, uh, You owe me a couple of kids. You, you, You owe me. And we said that when we get to that point, we weed out intimacy, we weed out trust, we weed out romance. Why? Because when everything is expected, there's no space or margin or room to express unconditional love. We said unconditional love is a gift, and the moment you expect it, it's no longer a gift. And so uh, we've been looking at this series, asking, you know, how do we get everything back here in this desire box so that we can get back to that place of being in a covenant relationship as opposed to a contract relationship. You do for me, I'll do for you. If you're not doing for me, I'm not doing for you. I mean, isn't that the dynamic that happens so often in in marriages? Sit two people down, what's going on? Well, he did this, and he did this, and he did this, and so I stopped this, and I stopped this, and I stopped this. Oh, so you let them determine your behavior. Well, kind of. And we said that we need to treat our spouse the way God in Christ Jesus treated me, that while I was still a sinner, Christ died for me, that God moved in my direction when I was at my worst. And, and the moment I said yes to Jesus Christ, I now have a debt-free relationship with him. I owe him <coughs> nothing. I owe him nothing in terms of maintaining this relationship. It was a free gift that was given. And that the way that we can move to where we need to be in our marriage is to say, you know what, um, out, of, out of reverence for you, Jesus, I'm going to treat him that way. For you, Jesus, I'm going to treat her that way, irrespective of his behavior, irrespective of her behavior, simply because you treated me this way, my way to say thank you to you is to treat him this way, to treat her this way. And that's 
That's hard. And marriage, more than any other relationship, is fertile ground for conflict, right? And have you ever had um, an argument or a fight with your spouse, and at the end of the fight, it was resolved, but it wasn't really resolved, right? You, like, you stop fighting, but nobody really knows where the fight really came from, and there wasn't really good resolution to what was going on in the midst of it. And I, I, I love, and this is not going to be on the screen, but I love what James says. He says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires? That battle within you. You desire, but do not have, so you kill. Desires in themselves are not bad. But what causes fights and quarrels is mismanaged desires. I did not steward my desires well. What does that mean? It means I started expecting. What, what causes fights and quarrels in your marriage? You expected him to do this and he didn't. You expected her to do this and she didn't. And because she didn't and he didn't, you guys are now in a war because you desired and then you expected and he didn't meet your expectations. She didn't meet your expectations. And it says it, there in James, you desire but do not have, so you kill. And you're like, well, he's not dead yet. <coughs> but romance is. Trust is. Margin for unconditional love to be expressed in the next several hours, <laughs> dead, flatline, no pulse. Hearts knit together in oneness, dead. Oh, you mismanage this, you, you'll kill. You'll kill a lot. You'll kill far more than you realize. Well, as we continue forward uh, in all of this, we have to ask ourselves uh, the question, so what do we do? Right, so, okay, I'm supposed to put everything back in, in, in my desire box, and I'm supposed to focus on him, I'm supposed to focus on her. If you're human, here's your question. What do I do with this? So if I'm supposed to make my whole marriage about making his dreams come true or her dreams come true and not expecting anything, what about everything in my box? We're going to talk about that together. And uh, it's important to understand that um, the solution is not to ignore what's in your box, to act like it's not there. To get so busy with activity that you numb yourself to the reality of the desires inside your heart. And then your spouse does the same thing too. Because when you get so busy with activity or apathy that you ignore the desires in your box, you unwillingly communicate to your spouse this message. I am as disinterested in this marriage as you are. I'm not going to be alive to my own heart so that I can be alive to your heart in any way. So, in 1 Peter chapter 5, I believe he answers the question, what do you do with what's in your box? And where we are going to pick up, it's in the middle of a conversation that Peter is having, and it's all on this idea of relationship. But, and so this applies across the board in all relationships, but we're kind of putting our marriage lenses on and viewing this passage through the lens of marriage. 1 Peter Chapter 5, begin with me in verse number 5. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourself to your elders. Keep going. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility towards one another. Because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. We'll just kind of pause there for a second. So, um, clothe yourself with humility. Humility. What, what does it mean to be humble and, and, and understanding humility? Our world understands... Hey, are you golfing today? I'm not, but thanks for asking. <laughs> Back up here. Ha! 
Hi, live stream. You're watching this online. Um, <laughs> our world understands humility this way. Our world understands humility based on rank. Oh, 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 you have that title. Therefore, I have to be humble. I have to submit myself to you. The world understands it based on, on, on title and man-made authority. But it's not rank or position that produces true humility. Jot this down. Biblical humility is a decision that I'm going to choose to put you ahead of me, not because of who you are, but because of who I am. And the idea there is that, you know, you have a box of desires, and I have a box of desires, and humility says, I'm going to put your box of desires first. In every relationship, but especially in the marriage one, I'm going to choose to put another person ahead of me. I'm going to focus on yours, not mine. Go back there to uh, verse 5, and, and it said, next slide, to clothe yourselves with humility. Now, that word clothe um, has a very specific picture in it that, uh, in the original language, that Peter's audience, who's primarily Jewish, would have got it, went, ah, right away. <laughs> clothe yourself is the same um, word that's used to describe someone putting an apron around their waist, a slave putting an apron around their waist. And here would have been the imagery they would have gotten right away as readers. It would have immediately brought to mind when Jesus took an apron and put it around his waist. And he washed the disciples' feet. And so, we're, we're in, in the same way, to, to model him, to follow him, we are to clothe ourselves with humility, to dress ourselves with humility. And I brought my, uh, my apron from home, and uh, there is, and if you've ever worked uh, in restaurants or anything else, when you put an apron on, I didn't wash it, <laughs> Me remember the inspiration came this morning, when you put an apron on, there's a mindset that goes with it, that I'm, that I'm, I'm here to do a service for somebody else. I'm here to serve somebody other than me. The chef doesn't make dinner for himself and go, then I'll, I'll get to you in a minute. Uh, the chef goes hungry so that the other people can eat. And that in marriage, this is how we are supposed to function. We're, we're, we're to clothe ourselves. You are to don the apron of a slave. Whoa, I don't know about that. You don't know who I am. I deserve better. Jesus Christ deserved better, but he put the apron on. And since he did that, I can do that. So there, there, there is a sense in which when I dress myself this way, when I'm clothed this way, there's a humility. I'm, I'm, I'm putting you first. But in marriage, what often happens, this is uh, Elizabeth. I'm not even going to dare try to put this on. It's a bib, right? And just as there is a certain uh, mental orientation that goes in dressing yourself with an apron, there also is a mental orientation when you put on the bib, right? I mean, we put this on Eliana, or when we put this on Elizabeth, immediately they do this. <laughs> right? Well, they're hungry. And so when you wear the bib, the model, the understanding is, oh, you, you're going to, you, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get, I'm not going to give. Now, most people, especially in churches, realize, well, I can't just walk around with this on, so I'll put this on, right? Isn't a good marriage this? No, it's not. Because a biblical marriage is one in which I don't have this right. Because this communicates expectation, right? If I put this around Elizabeth's neck and say, just wear it all day. What? No, no, no. Let's eat, right? She expects something when this is around her neck. I don't expect anything when this is around my, my waist. I'm here to serve, not be served, right? And so in marriage, you've got to don the apron 
and not the bit. He's going to continue to build on this analogy. Keep going in verse 5. Because... Why, why am I going to do that? Why am I going to take this apron? Why am I not going to put that bib on? Right? I mean, I I need to eat, and what, what what about me? Because God opposes the proud. Well, what's a proud person? A proud person is the person who's thinking about himself. The proud person is the one who has this thought in their mind. Well, what about what about me? What, what about me? And uh, there's a sense in which in marriage. Anytime we have this, what about me? We are putting ourselves first, right? You know, you have this conversation, there's this issue going on, and your spouse shares their heart, and you're like, but, 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 but what about me? I, you know, and immediately what you've communicated is, no, 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 I heard what you had to say, but now you need to hear what I have to say, because what I have to say is more important. I'm of, I'm of greater value than you are. And God's word makes it very clear. Here, here's his attitude. God opposes the proud. Opposition uh, literally means, uh, in the Greek language, to work against. God works against a man or a woman who does their marriage from the perspective, but what about me? And Because and, when you get this person over here going, yeah, yeah but, but what about me? What about my needs? What about my wants? And the other one's going, yeah, but what about me? What about my needs and my wants? And they are locked in a huge struggle. And the reason that, listen, this might be the biggest eye-opener for you today. The reason they are locked in this struggle is this one very simple reason. God is working against your marriage. He's not going to honor that. Not when he donned the apron for you and gave it to you as an example. You two walk around with a bib around your neck, God is at work against you. God's not going to honor that because God's not getting glory out of that. It is the exact opposite of the message of the cross of Jesus Christ. We struggle, we struggle, we struggle with our bib around our neck. And with our bib around our neck, we go, God, where are you? Come on, God, I need help in my marriage. I mean, I'm doing all this stuff, but I'm not getting any love. I'm not getting affection. I'm not getting respect. I'm not getting this and this and this. God, where are you? And God says, I'm over here resisting the proud. Jot this down. God actively works against a marriage built around two me's. And God will wait till you are, till that proud person is broken, beat up, and busted enough that they get humble. And when they get humble, God gets involved. We see that back in the verse. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Now, the, the, the passage there that says God gives grace to the humble... It's not talking about grace in terms of salvation grace, like I'm going to die and go to heaven grace. This is sustaining, enduring grace. This is grace in the moment. This is God giving you the power to do what you need in the moment for the moment. And what God is saying, if you will will clothe yourself in humility, if you will don the apron in your marriage and take off the bib, You put them first, just as I put you first, I'll get involved in that. I'll empower you to do what you need when you need to do it. Now, that is a powerful promise. That if you decide, you know what, I'm going to wear the apron and not the bib, God says, I'll make sure you have everything you need to do. You have every ounce of strength and power you need to do everything you need to do with the apron tied around your waist. Right? Because our, our argument is this. I can't keep that up. You're right, you can't. You need the sustaining grace of God. And God has promised you that he will give it to you. And we think, man, if I do this, I'm just going to wear myself out. Oh, it's going to work. But let me ask yourself, how are things going right now? I mean, you think you're wearing the the apron, but you also have the bib on right now, right? How's that working? And, and, And maybe in your own frustration, in your own prayer life, you said these things to God. God, I've done everything I can do. I don't know what else to do in this marriage. I've, I, I, I've done this, I've done this, I've done this, I've done this, and God's like, it's not working, is it? No, it's not enough, is it? No. How about you try humbling yourself? How about you take off that bib? Just wear the apron. And if you do, 
If you humble yourself, I'll give you grace. I'll get involved in that on your benefit. And then we see verse 6. Humble yourselves. In case we missed it somehow, humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. This phrase, under God's mighty hand, hand uh, is an Old Testament reference where God told the nation of Israel, you need to humble yourselves. And when God told the nation of Israel, you need to humble yourselves, what he was saying to the nation of Israel is, I want you to declare your dependence upon me and announce your obedience to me. And in marriage, here's what that looks like. It means you tell God what God already knows. God, I don't, I, I can't fix this. It's you telling God what God already knows. You can't change him. You can't fix her. It's telling God what God already knows. You can't heal him. You can't make her feel better. God, I'm powerless here. Not for lack of trying to fix him. Not for lack of trying to change her. When you humble yourself, you're saying, God, I need you. I cannot fix this marriage on my own. And here's the promise. He says, Okay, if you will just do that, if you just acknowledge that you can't fix it, you can't change it, no matter how hard you try, I will lift you up in due time. Now, let's be honest. That phrase in due time, we hate that. Because here's what we know <laughs> all too well. Due time and my time are not the same thing. Because my time is I hear a message at church on Sunday, go, okay, God, you got my attention. I'm going to take off the bib and just wear the apron, and I'm going to serve him, and I'm going to serve her. But without realizing it, we have this expectation that suddenly come Thursday, he's going to drop to his knees and go, I'm so sorry I haven't been there for you emotionally. And when it doesn't happen, we think, what about me? Apron goes off, try that, bib goes back on. Feed me, feed me. What about me? The Bible says, if you will humble yourself in due time, God will move. Now, let's look at the realities we have in front of us. You've tried everything you know, and you can't fix it. In fact, in fact, you've only made a mess. Because every attempt that you've made to try to fix it really has ultimately been about this. If I can make him or her change, if I can make him or her feel better, maybe they'll start doing some of the things I expect. Maybe I'll, start be, maybe I'll be happier in this marriage uh, than I already am. So you know that when you do things on your own, it never works. And then there's God who's saying, in due time, I'll lift you up. And due time is not my time, but we have the promise of God that says, if you will humble yourself, I will give you strength until I move, and then a day will come when I will move. So I either have to wait for God to do what I can't do or keep trying to do it on my own and mess this whole thing up even more, drive a deeper wedge in our marriage to the exaltation of myself, my needs, and my wants as I don the bib in the marriage and I forsake the apron. Verse 7. Yeah, go back and put that on there. I didn't, I didn't say that. Let's get that down. Jot this down. You have to decide to wait for due time rather than my time if you want to experience God's grace in your marriage. Have to wait for due time rather than my time. How do we try to get my time? <coughs> Emotional manipulation. Man, you get puffed up and big and leave me alone and I don't want to talk about it. <coughs> it's a way to shut her down. And ladies, um, a misuse of your emotions, a misuse of your tongue, and you try to emotionally manipulate and try to get him to do that. And so you've got two people who are trying to manipulate the other person, and it's, it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Okay? Verse 7. So what do we do? Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Now, 
The idea, if you use your, your mind here and, and picture this idea of somebody casting something. If you were to cast something, a, a rock, a, a ball, a stick, whatever it is, anytime you cast something, isn't the expectation in your mind as you consider that picture always the same thing? And that's this. Whenever I throw it, whenever I cast it, it's always out of my reach at that point. The moment I cast it, I can't reach out and grab it anymore because it's beyond my reach. I removed my potential to grab it and take it up again if I've truly cast it. You cast a rock, you throw it out there. A stick, you throw it out there so that you can't stay where you are, reach down there and take it back again. What about all my hurts? What about all my, you know, if I put him first, uh, if I put her first, what about, uh? God says, all that anxiety, all that worry, all that fear, you take it like a rock, and you throw it so that you can't reach it anymore. Cast all your cares on him. So you're not taking this rock and throwing it out there in the stream and watching it sink. You're taking your cares, your worries, your anxiety. If I put him first, if I put her first, what if they never, what if they won't start, what if they won't stop? You take all that and you go, ah! God the Father says, I'll catch it. I'll take it. Give it to me. Why? Because he cares for you. Literally, it means because you are of concern to him. It's like going to God and saying, God, I've got all these things and these desires, these hopes and these dreams that I've had in marriage. And if I just wear the apron, I, what if he never? What if she never? And I'm afraid and I'm scared. And God would ask you this question. Does, does this whole house and all that it represents, does that... Does that produce an anxiety in you? Does it produce a fear inside of you? Does that matter to you? Yes, God, it does. Would you give it to me? Would you give it to me and, and remove it from your reach? Why am I going to do that? Because I, I care about that. Well, you're God, right? I mean, like you reign and rule on high. Universes are at your beck and call. Why would you even care about this? because I care for you. And the things inside this desire box, they matter to you. And they matter to you. They matter to me. If it's of concern to you, it's of concern to me. And, 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 and if it causes you anxiety, and you're wondering, will he or, or, or won't she? Give it to me. Give it to me. Cast your anxiety on me. Do you know that actually uh, um, an example of pride is holding on to all of your anxiety? Because still, it's about me. I'm holding on to it. You, 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 I'm a worry wart. Uh, I, I'm concerned. I can't sleep. I'm anxious. Oh, all this stuff. It's a form of, it is a backwards form of pride. Because you're still holding on to it because it's still about me. Right? You've never asked a person who's worried or anxious why they're worried or anxious, and they have lacked a very quick answer. And the answer has always been about me. Well, I'm afraid, and if I don't, and what about, and me, 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 me. The, an act of humility is to take these things and go, here, God, they're not mine any longer. I'm, I, I'm going to shed them off me because I can't carry my burdens. I can't carry my anxiety and wear an apron in my marriage at the same time. So God, I'm going to give them to you. They're yours, and I'll let you handle them. And God, I want you to know for certain, he cares intensely for what is going on in your heart and all the desires that you have. And here's the thing. There's nothing off limits to God. This is the great thing about God. There's nothing off limits. You might have a desire that you would have a hard time even sharing with a friend because you think it might sound silly or naive or whatever it is. You know that God, God will never laugh at your desires. He'll never make fun of them. He'll never diminish them. He'll never ridicule them. That's why you can trust your desires with him. God, I hope that I dream that one day, and it's just not happening. It's okay. It's okay. Give it to me, Brian. Give it to me. I'll hold it so you can wear the apron. And if you will wear that apron, 
in due time, I will move in that area of your life. And what I've heard from so many people is this. People who are willing to wait on due time instead of my time. Here's what they would conclude. They would say, after a season of time that lasted longer than I thought or hoped for, God eventually did move. But, here's what they would say, the biggest move of God didn't happen in him or in her when they changed. The biggest move of God happened when I waited for due time and I humbled myself and God changed me. And person after person after person would give this testimony if they had the opportunity. If they stewarded, if they stewarded their desires well, and if they wore the apron well, and they leaned into the promise of God, here's what they would tell you. If I had it to go back and do over again, I would rather have due time than my time because only in due time did I get the God change in me that I needed. Had I wanted my time, it would have been all about me. And I would not have met God in a tangible, real way like I did when I was forced to wait for due time. And if you are willing to do this, to wait, to learn to cast your anxiety, and what if he never, and what if she never, if you'll learn to cast that on him and wait for due time and let God work in you and you refuse, adamantly refuse to wear that bib and you just don the apron and you're in due time, God will lift you up. And he will give you the sustaining strength and power in the moment, for the moment, every single day. So, real quick, application. What, what, what do we do? You've got to begin to learn how to, have, how to talk about the stuff that's in the desire box. But you've got to learn how to do it in, in an effective way. So let me give you three words to help with the box talk. It's going to be easy for the guys to remember. It's the word car. C, confess. Confess. Confession is always the first step of humility. You don't have humility without confession. And you need to confess to your spouse. Take responsibility for the ways in which you knowingly have taken desires and made them expectations. I said, you owe me. To the degree that you know that you've done that, you need to confess that and say, I'm sorry. When you have that conversation, don't begin this way. Let me tell you about some expectations I've had for you. <laughs> it's not going to work. And also don't begin the conversation by saying, let me tell you some expectations that you had on me. That's not going to work either. Confession, humility. And then ask. Ask. And, and here is, a, here is a uncomfortably penetrating question that only the humble will ask in their marriage. You ready? It's not going to be on the screen. Where do you feel pressure to live up to my expectations? Ask your spouse that. Where do you feel pressure to live up to my expectations? And here's why you ask that question. Because maybe in your confession, right, you acknowledge, you know, in these areas, I've, I've taken desires and turned them into expectations, but don't think you are that clear in your own understanding of yourself that you've got a complete list at that point. There may be other areas in which you have unknowingly uh, taken desires and morphed them into expectations. And you need to create an environment by which your spouse can speak into that. And then ask this question. Equally as penetrating, equally as challenging, only the humble will touch it. What can I do? to make our marriage richer. Now, man, you need to ask that question when you go home. Not because your wife is secretly sitting right there going, um, I wonder if he's going to do that. <laughs> Here's why you need to ask that question when you get home, because it's like rolling out the red carpet and inviting your wife to to answer this question. Here's, here, here, here's what you're really asking. Honey, would you give me a peek what's in here? Can I get a little glimpse in here? Asking the question, what will make our marriage richer, is a way for you to get a sneak peek of what's in her desire box. Now, when you ask that question, whether it's men or women, doesn't matter, and you're the one who hears it, be wise 
with the answers that you give. And, and what I mean by that is don't tell your spouse everything that's in their box. Don't empty, don't empty your box in that moment. I'm just, guys, don't expect your wife to tell you everything that's in that box. Why? Because they want you to keep coming back and opening that box day after day after day after day. It is one of the greatest ways you communicate your love to her. Don't say empty the box for me today. It's give me something today, and I'm going to come mine for it tomorrow, and then the next day, and then the next day, and then the next day, and then the next day. Don't go a day that you don't get in her box and mine it. And then, when you, when you ask that question, don't share desires that have no potential of ever coming true. I'll give you an example. So if I were to sit down with Erica and say, honey, you know, I was in church, and I asked everyone this question, I'm like, I got to ask it too, and so, honey... Um, what would make our marriage richer? In other words, you know, what? Tell me your desires. If she were to say, well, I always desired that I would marry a rock star. <laughs> Sorry, right? There is no hope of that coming true. You've heard me sing. There's no hope of that coming true. All I am doing from that point going forward is living every day with an, ex, with, with an awareness that I will never, ever fully make my spouse satisfied. So be wise. Be honest, but be wise. Don't load your spouse with things they cannot meet. You live in, listen, you live in a fallen world. Some of your dreams just are not coming true this side of heaven. And then lastly, reward. There's a principle that applies in every single relationship you will ever be in, and that is this. Whatever is uh, rewarded is repeated. Whatever is rewarded is repeated. Listen, it worked with your little kids, right? You potty train them. Oh, good job, Billy. Here's some chocolate. And what is Billy doing? I like chocolate. Five minutes later, I got to go again, right? There's a sense in which that same dynamic should be at play in your marriage, right? So, so ladies, your husband makes an uh, attempt, or at least what you think is an attempt, to try to uh, find out what's going on in your heart, in your desire box, and, and, and you recognize that, whether he was or not, and whether it was a smooth, or he stumbled and tripped, and it was a hot mess. No matter what, you reward him. Honey, thank you so much. Thank you for caring what's in my heart. I'm so grateful I have a man of God who cares about what's going on in my heart. And he's going to go, huh? <laughs> and he won't say anything intelligible, but on the inside he's going, yes, I did it. I want to do it again. Whatever is rewarded is repeated. Over reward your spouse so they know how important that desire box is to you. Okay. Let me just say that the, the tension in the room is palpable. <laughs> because there is, um, in the spiritual sense, you can, you can just feel the weight of broken hearts, unmet desires and unfulfilled expectations and I want to simply just ask you this question as the praise team prepares to lead us some more in worship have you willingly or unwillingly taken off your apron have you de decided I've tried and I've tried and I've tried and I just can't try anymore When, when can I take this thing off? Here's your answer. When Jesus Christ takes it off on your behalf. That's when. You go, oh, you don't understand. Do you know how long I've been wearing this and he doesn't do anything and she won't this? Let me ask you this question. How many years did your Savior Wear this apron on your behalf. 
when you didn't give a rip about him? How many years? Some of you, 10, 20, 30, more than that, years. And, and, and your spouse, you've been married 5, 10, 15, 20, or even 30 years. There's no comparison, guys. Listen, and you, you know it better than anyone else. Your spouse is a mere mortal. You ignored, used, and abused the apron tied around the, ra- the waist of the immortal God. That is a much greater offense. And yet, he didn't wash his hands of you. As we're talking today, maybe you find yourself going, okay, I, 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 don't, I didn't get it until now. Yeah, I, 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 I've been wearing the bib. I've been, I've, I've been expecting some things, and they, and they haven't come true. And kind of like a little kid would when they don't get what they expect, in my marriage, I'm throwing a tantrum. Because I'm tired of wearing the apron and getting nothing back. Guys, you can't not fix your marriage on your own. You can't improve it on your own. You've tried and you've tried and you've tried and you came up empty. It's because God was working against you. Would you let him do a work in you and in due time he will do what only he can do? So that not only is the marriage fundamentally changed, but you are fundamentally changed as well I want to pray for, for, for you for me and uh, as we enter into this time of worship and, and, and sing these songs to the Lord I would just ask this question would you be willing to take a, that first step of humility maybe God is speaking to your heart today challenging you, convicting you a little bit going oh man I, I didn't see the bib until today and I, and I haven't been wearing the apron. Would you be willing to take an, an act of humility and as we worship? Maybe you should come to the front and spend some time on your knees. Right? Because God opposes the proud, but oh, man, the humble? Grace comes rolling. Do you need some grace today? Come to Jesus. Come to the altar. You felt the opposing power of God. How about you now experience the sustaining grace of God in your hearts? We stand together. Father, as we continue on in this uh, this time of worship, we are uncomfortably aware of... uh, where we fit in all of this, how we treated our spouse. I pray, Lord Jesus, that we would be willing to be broken right now, humbled, that we would not stand in pride, but humble ourselves, be willing to come before you, to leave our seat, come to the front of the church, to leave our instrument and come off the stage, whatever it is. We simply ask God that you would examine our heart based on the reality of the degree to which the way we are conducting ourselves in our marriage would give you glory. And where it isn't, where it hasn't, may we begin with confession now that we can experience your grace that only you can give. So Spirit of God, propel us, move us, shake us. Just don't leave us where we are. In Jesus' name, amen.